All right. Good morning, everyone. Welcome. I always notice that uh, whenever Ann starts with the introductory music, the, the crowd seems to double. We could go another couple of rounds, and, and then next thing you know, we'll be pulling out some chairs. Anyway, welcome to worship today. I want to, we have a, a surprise guest, Reverend Richard Williams. Would you please stand just for a second? And his son, Michael, Reverend Richard Williams is a disciples minister. He was at the uh, First Christian Church in Lawrenceville for a number of years, and now he is uh, with the Disciples uh, Church Extension Fund, and I don't quite remember what your position is exactly. Oh. Including Georgia. Awesome. It sounds really important. Good to have you with us here. Welcome. Also very, very happy to welcome Dr. Jordan Freeman back on the violin. It's so good to have you with us today. Okay. We're going to have dual and violin somewhere in there, right? No, just kidding. It's just so, it's so wonderful to have you. We appreciate you and, and your contribution. And all, all the members of the choir and, the, and David, of course, and Anne on the piano. And just music is a very important part of what we do. So uh, thank you. Good music is good theology. And so we, we feel like anytime we enhance the worship service, we are bringing ourselves closer to God. So really appreciate all that, that y'all do there in the music department. Okay, uh, Herman Atwood had a birthday this past week, and as you know, he was in the hospital. Uh, he is still in the hospital. This morning, he had his, you know that old song, This Little Piggy went to the st So This Little Piggy came home. Do you know which toe that is? It's the one next to the big toe. So you have the big toe, and then you have the one right next to it. The index toe, the pointer toe, right? Yeah, okay. So, like, if this is the big toe, this is the, this is the one, okay? So, this morning, uh, he had his uh, little piggy went, came home, toe, index toe, amputated because he had some infection in there and because of his diabetes and so on. Uh, they felt it best. But the good news is it was only the tip of the toe that was infected, and, they, and the doctor believed that if he had taken the entire toe, that it would be a good safety measure. Herman has come out of surgery successfully and, and resting well, and so the, ha the family are all happy. And anyway, we wanted to, I want to let you know that, even though it's not prayer time just yet. Okay, uh, do we have any other birthdays? I'm, I'm not aware of any. Okay, is anybody hiding a birthday that we're not aware of? Okay, if, in that case, let's move on to the announcements. The next slide, of course, as always, we are continuing to collect non-perishable food items for Networks Cooperative Ministries. As you can see out there in the narthex, there's a, a cart and some goods there that are there. The need is always there, and the need is great. And so anything we can do to help the, the less fortunate, those who need uh, canned food and canned protein and stuff, thank you for what you do, and, and let us continue to do so. They uh, at Networks have been very complimentary of our congregation and our consistent giving to that, uh, to that cause. And again, we continue to offer math tutoring on Sunday mornings at 9.30. If you know any kids, elementary school, middle school, who struggle with math, please let them know and let them come and, and see what they can learn from our awesome tutor, who, uh, Kirk, and, and uh, you know all about that. Next slide, please. On Wednesday nights at 5 p.m., the children's music program continues, the Tucker Young Festival Singers. And then, of course, we have one more week of our Old Testament study this week, and then the Wednesday following, May the 3rd, let me make sure that I'm not making an unclear statement. On May the 3rd, the next Wednesday, we will begin our book study of On Life After Death by Dr. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross. Uh, you say Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, and everybody says five stages of grief which we were all somewhat familiar with, but she wrote this wonderful book about experiences that people have, near-death experiences, and what they come back and report. It's going to be a wonderful study. I know many of you are planning to be there, so I look forward to it. It's going to be a great time, and uh, if you haven't ordered a book, please do so soon, because week after next, we will start. Next slide, please. Uh, yes, sir. Thank you for asking for clarification. The Bible study is at 6 o'clock. Yes, 
And because uh, if choir members want to come, we will be sure to cut it off at uh, 6.58 or 6.55 or 6.50, whatever we need to do in order to let you guys get by uh, the bathroom on your way into here or whatnot. But thank you for that, yes. Today is our Home Fit Workshop. Uh, thank you for those of you who have signed up. Apparently, between those of you who have signed up and people who have signed up online, we have about 48 or 50 people that are scheduled to come. We have some light foods back there, thanks to Joe Williams, who's probably still back there uh, helping set up, and also Gail, who did a great job of helping with all of that. Home Fit, uh, what I was going to say, sorry, is that we have some light uh, refreshments, some little sandwiches, mini sandwiches, and some sweets, I think, and some tea and water and so forth. If you didn't sign up but you'd like to come, we'd like for you to, to, to stick around and uh, keep that in mind. Okay, as we go on, next slide, please. Next Sunday, be sure to buy your tickets for the taco truck. Uh, sorry that Robert's not able to be with us, but I understand he's actually dealing with the taco truck this morning because he had a little bit of an issue yesterday. But uh, he still plans to be with us next Sunday. Tickets are $10, which is a bargain. And, of course, you get, you're going to have a choice of this menu here. And I, I may be wrong, but I thought he said something about two tacos and a drink or something like that. And, uh, you know, you had me at tacos, all I could say, right? Tacos are never wrong. That's all I'm going to say. Uh, so, but that's next Sunday. Therefore, if you haven't bought a $10 ticket, please do so. Uh, and do we have another slide? Uh, well, they're right out here, and you can sign up, and uh, Susan's got those, and she'll be glad. Uh, you can also, quite honestly, you could go online and pay for the tickets, and then we would receive that information, and we would reserve that for you. It's, uh, it's not as convenient as you giving us a $10 bill or a check or whatever, but it can be done, right? And the checks will just be made out to the church, and we'll make sure that the money gets to Robert. Okay. Uh, after this meeting, there will be a very brief called board meeting, and Marsha is in charge because she's the, the vice chair or the chair of vice or whatever we call that. So Frank Sinatra is out of town, but she's got it covered. And that will be a really long, boring meeting, right? All of two seconds. So those of you who are on the board, you got to approve a couple of things, and the faster you, you get up here and do that, the faster you can get back there and grab a sandwich and, and listen to the Home Fit presentation. All right, is that good enough? All right. Okay, so on May the 20th at uh, New Hope Christian Church in Lawrenceville, there is a women's gathering there. So I think you women know about that. It's a CWF and Disciples Women uh, presentation. Next slide, please. And Tucker Day. Once again, we have our upcoming Tucker Day, which is May the 6th. And it's going to be, of course, downtown in Tucker. It's going to be a wonderful day. Thank you to everyone who has signed up to be a part of that. It's going, to be a, it's going to be a wonderful opportunity for us to get out there and meet around 3,000 people who live in our community and let them know what a wonderful congregation we have, what wonderful people you are, and what a nice home feel that this congregation has. And we've been doing this for a number of years. It's going to be a wonderful opportunity. If you haven't signed up yet, we'd love to have you uh, come. And of course, I think the next slide is probably for the Hosta exhibit, and our, our good friend Stephen Blair, who is a, a botanical artist, is going to have a display there, an exhibit or competition. We're expecting blue ribbons here, my friend. All right, there we go. So that'll be the same day. It'll be in the downstairs area of the First Baptist Church, which means it's within walking distance of our church booth. Okay, any more slides on there? Okay, we're good. Thank you. So, with no further ado, let us now prepare for worship. Good morning. Oh, Lord. Good morning and welcome to First Christian Church of Atlanta. Welcome to all here in the sanctuary as well as those of you who have joined us online. Our opening hymn, number 543, Blessed Assurance. Please stand.
Amen. You may be seated. I went ahead and shared with you, of course, about Herman Atwood and his surgery. Uh, it's a wonder of modern technology that uh, I can get a word right before the service about his, his uh, successful operation because Cindy was able to text me. So thank you to, to Cindy for that. I imagine that the Atwoods are probably watching us and participating in the service now, or they will catch the playback a little bit later. Also, make mention of several who have had knee replacement surgery recently. Of course, up here on the day, as you saw him hopping and skipping up here, right? Pete Adamson, who is, how many weeks is that now? Three? Four weeks, okay. And uh, now he did hop and skip up here without a cane, but I, I dared him to jump over the communion table, and he just, he said he wasn't quite ready for that yet. Okay, but it will, that day will come. Also, Mike Ritchie had his knee replaced earlier this week, and he's in the early stages of recovery, which means it's, it's painful. And uh, the recovery uh, is on its way, though, and we're continuing to pray for him. Bob Wallace had his a little over a week ago, actually closer to two weeks ago, and is recovering well, also dealing with the pain. But you know, I guess you're a living testimony that once you get past the pain, it was worth it. It's kind of like this life, you know, that life is filled with all kinds of pains and struggles, but it's worth it in the end, and God's going to bless us. Um, I am trying to remember, I feel like I've overlooked some things, so if there are others uh, that we have to report on, I apologize. I think everyone else is doing well. I haven't heard any bad news about anybody, and uh, so God is good, all right? We go before the throne of our Heavenly Father to pray, to lift up our words of gratitude and praise, but also our continuing words of care and concern. I invite you to join with me in prayer, and, it, and in the course of this prayer, I will say the following words. Hear us as we each pray from the silence of our hearts, and I will pause at that point and invite you to offer up your individual prayers to God. And after a few moments of silence, I will resume and we will say together the Lord's Prayer. Let us pray. Living God, long ago faithful women proclaimed the good news of Jesus' resurrection and the world was changed forever. Teach us to keep faith with them that our witness may be as bold our love as deep, and our faith as true as theirs. As your Son remained with his disciples after the resurrection, teaching them to love all people as neighbors, and as disciples in this age, we offer our prayers on behalf of the world in which we are privileged to live and our neighbors with whom we share it. Bless and multiply our gifts, our talents, our ministry, beyond our means. Take our two little fish and our five loaves of bread and feed 5,000 and more. For those who are recovering from surgery, from knee replacement, from an amputation, from a time in the hospital in rehab, we ask you to continue to bless and strengthen their bodies and their recoveries. For those who are still in grief over lost loved ones. Help them to know that their loved ones are not truly lost, but they are there waiting for the day when we shall be reunited. And that this life, with its pain and its trials, is brief, but eternity is forever. Encourage and strengthen their hearts with these words, O Lord. And now, in this hour of worship, hear us as we each pray from the silence of our hearts. And now, hear us as we join our hearts, minds, and voices 
In the prayer Jesus teaches us praying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. It is now our offering for the continued support of our church and, com and community. Will the deacons please come forward?
Lord, we believe in your word, and we honor it by giving and using these gifts to further our mission in our church and our community. Amen. You may be seated. It is now time for the Lord's Supper, the, the pinnacle, the climax, the most important part of our worship service when we, together as a body, come to participate in the, the bread and the cup. We meet heaven. We meet Christ at this table. We want you to know, if you are worshiping with us for the very first time, that we have a policy that is known as an open table. And by that, we mean simply that if you desire to partake of the Lord's Supper, we want you to come and partake. There is no membership requirement. There's no screening process. If you desire to partake of the Lord's Supper, we invite you to join us. We will do this in two ways. In a moment, the elders will come and pray over the bread and the cup, and they are wearing this beautiful purple latex gloves to let you know that they are observing safety protocols and they will hand a piece of bread and a cup to everyone who desires. But also here at the table, these two fine-looking deacons here, we also have what are called the uh, self-serve, hermetically sealed individual chalices, in which, of course, we have a little bread on one side and the juice on the other. But do know that we desire that you join us if you desire to be part of this love feast. You may ask, we do this every Sunday, right? And here we go again, communion time again, once more with feeling, right? Or like your shampoo bottle says, wash, rinse, and repeat. So why isn't this communion something that we do once and we're done? Why is it something that we repeat over and over again? I mean, after all, we believe that Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection is a once and for all thing. However, we have a desperate need to hold within our own hearts the reality, the power, and the amazement of what Christ accomplished with his death, burial, and resurrection. To do this well, Jesus said we need to become like children. And what is one of children's favorite words but again, right? You remember your children or maybe your grandchildren? Again. It's their favorite word. Do it again, Daddy. You know, you might say, oh, my arms are tired. I'm tired of swinging you around. Do it again, do it again, right? You can relate to this. Take me there again, Mommy. Sometimes children can be like broken records. They feel the joy of a moment. They experience the wonder of life with their young eyes. And they want to go again and again and again until they are exhausted. And even as they're falling asleep, what are they saying? Again. Repeating something again and again helps to ingrain it in our memories, in our hearts, and in our practice. It multiplies the joy. And the same can be true even for those of us who are very serious grown-ups, right? Repetition is sacred. Thankfully, God's mercies are new every morning, and we need them every morning and afternoon and evening. So here we are at communion again, washing, rinsing, and repeating, so to speak, breaking the bread and drinking the juice, remembering the reality behind these symbols, the wonder-working power of the blood shed for us, his death, burial, and resurrection for us. And now, for the words of institution. For this is what the Lord himself has said about his table, that on the night when Judas betrayed him, the Lord Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks to God for it, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, and he said, Take this and eat it. This is my body.
This is my body which is given for you. Do this to remember me. In the same way, he took the cup of wine after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant between God and you that has been established and set in motion by my blood. Do this in remembrance of me whenever you drink it. For every time you eat this bread and drink the cup, you are retelling the message of the Lord's death that he has died for you. Do this until he returns. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, as we take this bread representing your life that was broken for us, we remember and celebrate your faithfulness to us and to all who will receive you. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your Son, precious Jesus, dear God. And we come to you humbly and we ask you to forgive us of our sins, dear God, so that we can come and take the blood body and the blood of Jesus Christ and that we have the blessed assurance that we will be with you one of these days. These things rest in Christ's name. Amen. Of this Sunday, Psalm 78, verses 5 through 8. He established a decree in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our ancestors to teach to their children, that the next generation might know, might know them, the children yet unborn, and rise up and tell them to their children so that they should set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments 
and that they should not be like their ancestors, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation whose heart was not steadfast, whose spirit was not faithful to God. These are the words of God for the people of God. I think that's one of my favorites. Is it one of your favorites too? Yeah. All right. Wonderful. Thank you so much. I guess I could dismiss the Utes to Children's Church. You guys want to go? We did. Uh huh. Oh no. Well, mm -hmm. and tell everybody that you're covered by the blood. There we go. <laughs> well, welcome to parenthood, my friend. <laughs> In fact, that's kind of kind of the theme today, and I'll tell you why. Uh, Thursday, and two Thursdays ago, we took Ann and I took a really quick drive up to Murphy, North Carolina. I know, Marcia says, God, God's country, right? Anywhere you got the, the Appalachian Mountains and, and uh, 
the southern accent that I grew up with is heaven. I don't care. You know, so Murphy, North Carolina, Dalton, Georgia, whatever, Chattanooga, you know, just God's country, right? So anyway, we drove up there uh, because that's where my older, our older son and his family were located at the time. And, you know, they're what you call full-timers. They sold their house. They live in an RV and they travel the country. And uh, my son now has a job where he goes uh, from state to state and he repairs leaky RV roofs and he, has, he works for a company and that's what they do. And so they've been to about 30 states, many, many of them repeatedly over the last three years, all the way as far south as the Florida Keys, as far north as Maine. And they've been to Niagara Falls. They've been to all these places in between. So it's been a really interesting thing. But it also means we don't get to see them at will. So we have to take a little time off. We drove up to see them in Murphy, North Carolina, before they had to move a little further north. Well, it was my first time in Murphy. And uh, we, when we were there, uh, we met up, of course, with our daughter-in-law and our two granddaughters because our son was still out doing a job. And she, you know, we, we, we took the girls off her hands so we could play with them and keep them and so forth. And she kept telling us, you know, you want to go here and you want to go there. And this, here's this restaurant. And I'm thinking, well, I'd like to look at this Mexican restaurant over there. She's like, no, don't go over there. Go over here. And then she says, and you'll want to take them to a place called the, the Sweet Tooth. The Sweet, what's the name of the place? The Sweet Tooth. The sweet tooth. I kept calling it the sweet spot. Anyway. <laughs> and, and I'm like mildly annoyed by all this, you know, because you know, I'm spending the money. I want to pick where I'm going. But I realized through, this, through all of this, because I'm a little slow, I realized that this is where her grandparents lived when they were alive. And so that means she has all these memories of growing up and going to Murphy or to Blairsville, because I think they live somewhere in between. She had all these favorite places that she wanted, that she liked to go. And in particular, she had these fond memories of getting into the back of her dad's, I mean, her grandfather's pickup truck and riding to the Sweet Tooth. I have to tell you, what, what an experience the Sweet Tooth is. It's a little shack on the little side road in the country there, and you have to drive around it. I mean, you can walk up to the window, but it's so small. And once you get in that line, you're stuck. I mean, there's a car behind you, there's a car in front of you, you can't go anywhere. And as we pulled around to order at the window, there was a giant pickup truck in front of us. And there was a lady in that pickup truck. And let's just say she made a rather large order, and it took her a while to figure that out. And then finally, I noticed that she sort of opened the door and stepped out on the, you know, those big trucks have like a little step out there, right? A little landing. She, and then she handed a jar of quarters <laughs> to the cashier. <laughs> And so we're like, oh, my goodness. So anyway, the, the cashier asked her to move forward, and she moved forward, and we pulled up. And, you know, uh, I know I'm going to get in trouble for saying this, but having three females in the car, our order didn't happen quickly either, if you know what I'm saying, right? So anyway, we, we, got, we made our order. We got our ice cream, and that lady's still sitting in front of us there. And so finally she pulled away just as we got our order. But I realized that what my daughter-in-law wanted us to do is to create fond memories with our two granddaughters. She wanted them to have those same kinds of warm, nostalgic memories that, that she had. And of course, I can agree with that 100%. I bet all of you have some kind of warm childhood memories, right? Something that inspires nostalgia, something that makes you feel a little warm glow inside, maybe a little tear in the eye, if you're thinking about it. And I bet a lot of them revolve around things like family and food. Yeah, three of you? Just three of you? Okay. Maybe not all, but perhaps a lot of them do. For me, I would add music to the category, lots of great musical memories. And a slight detour here, just for a second, I, I know that there was a there was like this practice of a symphony where a couple of guys were talking, you know, maybe they play some kind of stringed instrument. And one said, you know, I really miss the opportunity of, of playing for a church. And the other one says, yeah, me too. That's something we ought to think about. 
Well, guess who has come to join us and to share their gifts with us, right? Jordan Freeman and David Bong. So we so much appreciate it. That's kind of Ed's story, too. I believe he was looking for a place to, to share, but also the place to call home, a place to, to be part of it. And that's wonderful because it's hard to get really great musicians who just want to give. But there's, I would assume there's some nostalgia there. There's some, you know, I grew up in church, and there's that important feeling, that sense of belonging. And I, I was blessed. I loved the offertory you played. And, and just, just because you'll know how weird I am, I was, not only was I enjoying that and hearing all those old hymns, but I was thinking, boy, that reminds me of the soundtrack to True Grit. You know, the remake, the one with Jeff Bridges? Same beautiful violin music and old hymns. I loved it. We really appreciated that. I can say the same. As a minister, I have so many fond memories of growing up in the church. I have so many fond memories of going to summer camp, of going to retreats, of going to youth group activities. But, you know, even, uh, and I was uh, sort of commiserating with your son Michael a little bit, uh, Richard, because, you know, not only did I drag my sons around to church all the time and to funeral homes and, and all kinds of stuff, but when I grew up, church was it. Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, youth group or no youth group. You know, I sat in adult Bible study probably when I was in middle school, you know, and so forth. But those things are just such fond memories. I can tell you, Anne's with the, with the children right now, or the youths, and um, she has the same story. You know, she became a church accompanist at the age of 12. And she's been doing that ever since. And, you know, this is just who we are. But I acknowledge, and I have to acknowledge, that when we have all these wonderful glowing feelings about nostalgia and church and our spiritual home, that not everybody has happy memories of church. And so I only say that because I know that I can't talk about the good things without acknowledging that sometimes churches hurt people. And I hope and pray that that never happens here and that those who have been hurt in other places will find this to be a safe place, a place to build new memories, good memories, and a closer relationship with God because of the fellowship that we have with each other. I do hope that First Christian Church of Atlanta is a safe place for that very reason. You know, we have here in this room, and some, some not in this room, a group that's called the 50s group. Does anybody know who I'm talking about? The 50s group? Yeah. Joel Grayson is one of them. Marlo is one of them. Uh, Bootsy is one of them, and she's with Herman in the hospital right now. Uh, I'm, who, am I missing anybody? I don't want to miss anybody. Because uh, Richard, yes, Richard, I knew that too. When I was in the hospital with... Uh, visiting with Herman and Bootsy on Friday. I said, and Richard, I know Richard's one of them too, and here I am forgetting you in person. I am so sorry. Richard is one of the 50s crew. Now, what that means is not that they're 50 years old, right? But you're one of the 50s? Oh, I, I was just about to explain. The 50s group means that they were the youth group in the 1950s. Yeah, so you guys are too young. Now, Pete is a lifetime member, and Millie is almost a lifetime member, but she, she uh, has more seniority than all the rest of you, right? Marlo's a lifetime member. Joel's a lifetime member. Who, who else am I overlooking? Anybody else here a lifetime member? Cindy Atwood is a lifetime member, and so I don't want to, you know, call out the number of years for all of you, but that's a few decades, right? And you guys have maintained this sense of community over <clears throat> the last 70 plus years, right? Okay. And I already mentioned all of others of you who are lifetime members, including uh, Millie, who remembers when all these rap scallions are running around causing trouble, right? You remember when Joel was like pulling girls' hair, right? And all those kind of things. <laughs> pulling the legs off of frogs maybe, making the girls cry, that kind of stuff. Yeah. I envy you, having had this long connection with this one church family. It's got to be a really, I know there's lots of ups and downs, but it's got to be 
a very wonderful experience. I think of all of my experiences growing up in church, revivals even, summer camp, retreats, lock-ins, Sunday school, those are probably some of the best experiences in my entire life. I'll even remember, Landon, you were baptized a few weeks ago. I'll never forget, I was, I was eight years old. I was seven years old when I was baptized, and I felt different. I'll never forget that moment. We have lots of meaningful experiences as adults, but they don't always seem to have the same impact on us as our childhood experiences. And I assume it's because these are our formative years, right? I can't say that any decade of my life has lasted longer than my first decade, right? The first 10 years seemed like the longest. And then the next 10 years went by quick, and then the next 10 years, and here I am, I was just saying to Ann yesterday, I'm 54 and a half, but I was just thinking back to my 40th birthday like it was yesterday, you know, and like I thought, well, I really turned a corner when I hit 40. Wait a minute. I'm a, I'm a teenager since that time, right? I'm, I'm 14 years older than that. It just goes by so fast. And I presume the same as, as much as the same for you. So our text today that uh, Elliot read for us, Psalm 78 verses 5 through 8, it makes a reference to many, uh, uh, sorry, to the importance of religious instruction with children. It is also intended to remind us of another familiar passage, and I'm sure you're all familiar with it, but we're going to read it real quickly here, and that's Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 1 through 9. Now this is the commandment, the statutes, and the ordinances that the Lord your God charged me to teach you to observe in the land that you are about to cross over into and to occupy, so that you and your children and your children's children may fear the Lord your God all the days of your life and keep all his decrees and his commandments that I'm commanding you so that your days may be long. Hear, therefore, O Israel, and observe them diligently so that it may go well with you and so that you may multiply greatly in a land flowing with milk and honey as the Lord, the God of your ancestors, has promised you. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all your might. Keep these words that I am commanding you today in your heart. Recite them to your children and talk about them when you are at home and when you are away, when you lie down and when you rise. Bind them as a sign on your hand, fix them as an emblem on your forehead, and write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. So this passage from Deuteronomy comes from a sermon that Moses delivered shortly before his death. As he was getting ready to pass the baton of leadership over to Joshua, as he was going to climb to the top of Mount Pisgah, see a view of the promised land, and that God would bury him, as the scripture says, And so, for one last time, he gathers the people together and he delivers this long series of reminders. Obviously, it includes a charge to keep the law of God as delivered at Mount Sinai, but there is a bit more. It it is a charge to the older generation, and in a sense, it is a charge to the rising generation of leadership to continue to instill the values and teachings of God's law in the generations that follow. Notice what else is implicit in these words. First of all, this is a little bit subtle, but you notice how it kind of includes what we sometimes refer to as the American dream? Now bear with me just for a moment. He says, so that it may go well with you, and so that you may multiply greatly in a land flowing with milk and honey. Isn't this what we want for our children? We want our children to live in a good land. We want them to have lots of resources available to them. We want them to be prosperous. We want them to be healthy. We don't want them to lack anything that they need. Right? Good times. Healthy children and prosperity. We might call this the good life. 
And Moses refers to this in this sermon. I just going to, was going to mention, I, I kind of went off script there, but I, I was going to mention that one thing that Ann and I have done for our two granddaughters that's along this line is that we are purchasing life insurance policies for them now. now they're five and eight. And so you're thinking, well, they're a little bit young, but you know why, don't you? Because by the time they hit 30, they could potentially have half a million or a million dollars in there. And all it costs us is about 100 bucks a month. Thinking about their future, thinking about what's good for them, looking after their well-being, even when we may not be around to ensure all of that. Why do we do these things? Because we care about that. And apparently, God wants us to have good things too. He wants us to live in a good land, the land that is flowing with milk and honey. So what's different here is how God prioritizes these things. You see, a lot of times as Americans, we put health, happiness, job security, education above everything else. Now, these are all good goals, but happiness is not, is not the goal it is a byproduct. What the scripture teaches us is this. God comes first and everything else should follow. Also prominent in this passage is the, are the teaching techniques or object lessons uh, for passing on the faith to another generation. So uh, if you guys are, uh, most of you probably are, have some familiarity with Jewish practice, right? So as an example, you know the very famous prayer called the Shema? Everybody, anybody know this one? Shema? How does it go? It's in there. It's uh, verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord alone. Right? The Lord is our God, the Lord alone. Um, sometimes you hear it a little differently in different translations, but that's what it is. That is a teaching technique. We teach our children little prayers. Now, in my case... That's not the one I learned, but I did learn that really famous one. It goes, what, uh, now I lay me down to sleep. You know this one, right? I also remember God is great, God is good, let us thank you for our food. And then, of course, we learned all the bad ones that you see in the comedy shows, you know, like good bread, good meat, good God, let's eat, that kind of stuff. But also this one, hero Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone, is followed by what it, Jesus himself identified as the greatest commandment, you shall lo love the Lord your God with all of your heart, your soul, and your strength. Also notice the words, recite them to your children and talk about them when you are at home and when you are away, when you lie down and when you rise. That's verse 7 up there. Does this remind you of saying those prayers at bedtime? You know, little children don't always know what to pray, but that's why we teach them, now I lay me down to sleep and so forth. We teach them songs like, Jesus loves me. We, we teach them, Jesus loves the little children. Red, how's it go? All the children, red, brown, yellow, black, and white. Yeah, that's right. They are precious in his sight. And then from that, we are supposed to learn some truth. And as they get older, they can expand to how great thou art and, and so forth. Did any of you have a family Bible growing up? Ah, yeah, just a few of you. I'm a little surprised. But, you know, there was a time in our history when a family Bible was a legal document just like a birth certificate, if you had your family genealogy written in there. So these are just some of the ways that a faith can be translated or transmitted to our generations. In verse 8, it says the following words, Bind them as a sign on your hand, fix them as an emblem on your forehead. And if you're familiar with, again, Jewish practice, you may have seen men with a, a box, right, and some leather uh, straps tied to his head, and then some straps wrapped around his arm. These are called tefillin. Tefillin is actually the Hebrew word for prayer. But these are objects that have scriptures inside, and this, the left arm is supposed to be closer to the heart, you see. They're visible and outward, but they have a way of sort of communicating to us this outward demonstration of prayer. And do you all know what a mezuzah is? Or a mezuzah, okay? At least one person. That's the little box 
that people have nailed to their posts, their doorposts, sometimes their gates. Uh, I had a professor at Emory who was a rabbi, and I think he had every door, po- every door frame in his house with a mezuzah posted there. And basically, the mezuzah is, a, is a, like a little box, and it has some scriptures printed on little scraps of paper, and they are in, inside of that box. And of course, you're supposed to know what those are. One of them is, hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is the Lord alone. And so they are posted there, and it's a daily reminder. That's why it says in verse 9, write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. Now, for Christians like us, we have other ways of doing this, don't we? We have Bibles, and we have crosses. We have a beautiful display here. There's a nice display for Easter, but here at the table, you know, year after year, day after day, week after week, we have these symbols of the Lord's Supper, and we have a cross. And then, of course, First Christian Church of Atlanta has this beautiful cross uh, that's been with this congregation for since before this building, right? Was it the previous building or even further back? Do y'all know? Just the, the Briar Cliff? Okay. But it is a, an ongoing symbol that uh, is recognizable, and it has memories attached to it, right? Many years of, uh, of attending church and so forth. We have baptism, which is a visible expression of being buried and risen with Christ. Uh, we have other ways that we enact our faith through instruction, through Sunday school lessons, through uh, Bible studies, confirmation classes, and all those things I mentioned already, retreats and summer camps and so forth. So the passage we started with in Psalm chapter 78, verses 5 through 8, and referring to the passage in Deuteronomy, which we just talked about a bit. <clears throat> Let's see if you can hear the connections when I reread our original text. Again, Psalm 78, verses 5 through 8. He established a decree in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our ancestors to teach to their children that the next generation might know, uh, not know them, excuse me, the children yet unborn, and rise up and tell them to their children so that they should set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments. And they should not be like their ancestors, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation whose heart was not steadfast, whose spirit was not faithful to God. When each of us read this, maybe we all get a different aspect of what's being uh, described there. Uh, That's the Deuteronomy passage. I'm sorry, I didn't make another slide, did I, for the original passage. It's my fault. No, no big. I just reread it. Everybody heard it, right? Okay, we're good. I should have made another slide in there. That was my fault. Anyway, you remember this, the parable about the four blind men who are touching the elephant, and they all get different parts. Well, I think the elephant is like a snake, and that's the guy that's holding the trunk and so forth. Well, when we hear this passage, um, Some may focus on words like decree and law and understanding. Others may focus on words like teach and tell and keep. Some may zero in on words like stubborn and rebellious. But today, I want to draw attention to the words ancestors and children and generation. I want us to see the importance of family the importance of family in the transmission of the gospel from this generation to to the next. One of the good takeaways from all the years I spent as a private school teacher is in a private Christian school is one thing that we told parents when they brought us their children. Now, many of you have been teachers. We have lots of former teachers, but not everybody taught in in a private Christian school. So what I need to point out is this. Everybody knows who's ever taught school, that parents sometimes don't do their job as parents. They expect you to do the job as parents, right? They want you to discipline their children. They want to make sure that you teach them what you're not able to teach them. And, and so there has to be some kind of balance there. So one of the things I thought we did really well is we would, at every opportunity, we would let the parents know the following things. Number one, we are not parents of your children, Okay. Instead, we are partners in their education. 
You have entrusted us with teaching them things like math and science and history in a Christian environment. We are not here to raise them. Does that make sense? In the end, that is the responsibility of the parents. In a congregation like ours, in many ways, is like a family. We cannot choose or control the families that we have been born into, but we can choose the family that we want to worship with. And I do hope that you feel that this is a very wonderful family environment. Like the community of Israel, we are charged with the responsibility of raising up a faithful new generation. And that, by the way, is why we struggle so hard in what seems to be a very steep uphill climb of creating and building a children's program here, right? I'm happy to say that as of right now, we have about six or eight children, I can't, I've lost count, who are back there right now learning in children's church. But when we came here, we didn't have any children, right? It's a slow, difficult process. We need your prayers. We need your support. And we're getting them. I didn't mean to imply that we aren't. But let us continue to make this worthy uh, struggle a reality. That we are charged not with having the best, you know, pastor in the world, the best preacher. We are charged with, with transmitting that gospel to a new generation. The biblical charge for us today is one of obedience to God and the religious instruction of the next generation. We are all at different points in our lives, but we are all capable of surveying our progress. When all is said and done, what do we want our legacy to be? We want to be known as the the prettiest church building on the street. Well, I know we have that, but uh, we want to have faith in a new generation be our legacy. And on that, and I, sorry, went over about seven minutes, but the good news is, after a brief board meeting, for those of you who have to stay for that, we do have some light refreshments in the back. I invite you to stand as we sing our closing hymn, which is, Open My Eyes. May God open our eyes to the mission field that we have, to a generation that needs the gospel and maybe doesn't want it or doesn't even know what it means. Help us to make our faith the legacy that we pass on to a new generation.
Amen. So this is what I'm going to ask real quickly. I want to ask David Bong, our latest, newest member, if he would be willing to go ahead and stand at the door, because you haven't had a chance to shake hands with people, right? For people to come over and give you the right hand of fellowship. So if that's okay, I'd also like to ask Reverend Richard Williams if he would be willing to step back there and greet people. Remember, Disciples of Christ Extension Fund, uh, if you want money, he's got it. And of course, uh, former minister at Jeannie Morgan's congregation, the First Christian Church at Lawrenceville. Uh, and I know Marsha is going to come up here and ask the board members who will come for a meeting. The rest of you, uh, let me invite you to come to the Home Fit meeting in the back if you like. Um, in the meantime, let me end with a blessing. Go in the love and peace of Christ, claiming your freedom to live victorious in Christ's love and in harmony with our brothers and sisters who have been reconciled in Christ's grace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Amen. Okay. Board members and Marsha, if you will come forward.